Good evening and welcome to a live bibliotherapy session all about lighthouses in literature tonight. I'm going to be shedding light in the darkness onto lighthouses in literature. I would love to know if you have any favourite lighthouses in literature that you can share with me this evening. So do send in a message either on Instagram or Facebook or you can send a message on Twitter or you can email me on ellabear2 at gmail.com and I'd love to know your thoughts about lighthouses in literature. I'm also always very happy to take personal bibliotherapy questions in these sessions. So if anyone has any particular bibliotherapy ailments that you'd like me to look at and address, I will very delightedly look at those with you this evening. Um, if you have one, maybe put it on the Instagram post and I can come to it at the end of the session. As you can see, I'm channeling the lighthouse this evening with my all in white attire and my very nifty lighthouse lamp in my hat, which I'm not going to have on all evening because it might blind you and or and or it might just become really annoying. Um, but then it is kind of fun and I do love that little glowing light which is showing you the light in the literary darkness. So welcome, lovely to have you here with me this evening. The first lighthouse is in recorded history was Egypt Pharos of Alexandria, built around 280 BC. The source of light was a huge open fire at its summit. As well as being the world's first, it was also the tallest lighthouse ever built, standing at a colossal 450 feet high, which is pretty incredible, isn't it? So when I first started thinking about this subject, I was under the illusion that lighthouses actually hadn't been around for that long. Um, I thought, you know, maybe it had been a few hundred years, but actually it's more like a couple of thousand years. So I guess it makes sense that we would have been trying to shed light on the ocean's darkness for thousands of years, ever since we started navigating the waters. But um, I didn't know it went back as far as that. I will stop uh, strobing you so that you don't get blinded by all these flashing lights. Uh, but I just thought it was rather fun to have a bit of light in your darkness. So lighthouses have fascinated authors ever since humans started protecting their shores and coastlines with beacons of light shining in that darkness. They symbolise hope, strength, navigational ability, vigilance and safety. But they also inherently uh, symbolise and bring to mind danger, death, madness, loneliness and isolation. They provide fabulous settings for romance, murder and becoming unhinged, all of which themes we're going to be exploring this evening. And I'm going to share with you the most thrilling and intriguing lighthouses that I have found in literature. And um, of course, if you have any favourites, do please let me know what they are. Uh, lighthouses have actually been in my mind also because there's currently a film available on Netflix called The Lighthouse, which some of you might have seen, which was released in 2019, produced and directed by Robert Eggers, and it stars Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson as two lighthouse keepers who descend into madness when a storm strands them on the remote island where they are stationed. Some of you may recognise this story as one which originally came from the pen of the great Edgar Allan Poe, who many of you know as being a remarkably terrifying and brilliant writer of detective stories and stories about people being buried alive and 
human hearts beating under the ground after the body has died. So Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story called The Lighthouse, which he left unfinished. And it's only about three pages long. You can find it online. And that story has been adapted into the film The Lighthouse, which is well worth a look. Um, it is a very compelling and terrifying film. But the story by Edgar Allan Poe is really very short and very much lacking in plot and drama. So it is a story that also could be responsible for the genesis of this book, which I'm going to come to in a minute, a book called Pharaside, which is rather marvellous. When I began researching this topic, I discovered a brilliant article by Nicholas Royal in The Guardian, which is all about lighthouses and fiction. He chose his 10 favourite lighthouses and fiction, and I'm going to definitely tell you about many of them. But he also has translated his very own lighthouse uh, book, Pharisaid, which is obviously why he was having his obsession with lighthouses. And I am going to tell you about this first because it was one of the first books that I discovered when I was thinking about this great topic, although there's so many that I want to come to. But this is actually the most recently published, I think, of all of them, perhaps. So it is a translation. Uh, it was originally written in French by Vincent Despart, and it was Nicholas Royal who translated it into English um, in 2021. And this book is utterly terrifying and gripping. But I am mentioning it first because it's also one which could well have been engendered by the Edgar Allan Poe short story that I was mentioning earlier, because it's also about a man who is drawn irresistibly to a lighthouse. He kind of falls in love with a lighthouse. He channels the lighthouse. He becomes the lighthouse. And then his inner being of something rather terrifying comes to the fore. He releases a kind of madness from himself. And I won't tell you what happens, but I will read you a couple of little sections of the book, which will give you an idea of what it's like. And just to read you a little bit of the blurb on the back, Geoffrey Lafayette, a lighthouse keeper with a passion for taxidermy, agrees to a six-month solo stint at Cordouan, the oldest lighthouse in France, located at the mouth of the Gironde estuary. I pray to God no one comes to the lighthouse during those six months, writes Geoffrey in his journal at the beginning of October. Just two weeks later, he writes, Cordouan has woken me up. Cordouan has stripped my soul naked. It has reminded me of everything that lies within. Corduan has saved my knives from retirement. Now, if that's not a rather terrifying introduction, I don't know what is. And this book is one that I've been reading um, only today. And it's actually got me so nervous that whenever I hear uh, a little noise from the door behind me, I'm jumping in my seat. That's how terrifying it is. It really is having quite a deep, crawly effect on the back of my spine. So I'm going to read you a little bit from the book, which I must say is also a very beautiful, beautifully produced book. Recently, it has come to my attention that within lighthouses and beacons, I'm highly thought of. For my willingness to take risks, my strong constitution and my heroic physique. They say I'll enter the annals, that I stand out, even if the profession isn't short of people like me. A magnetic character, no less, is how one engineer put it. These kindnesses came my way after the difficulties at Corduan. The lantern's 2,000 watts burnt a hole in Joel's retinas, a thousand watts for each of his drink-sozzled eyes. Misfortune never striking only once, the couple who shared caretaking duties with him died in a road accident eight days later. The administration installed two trainees as a stopgap, but there were problems. Stories of smuggling, 
or something along those lines. They didn't go into detail. And so they thought of me. They said, it's not hard work with the generators. Sorry, what have I got here? The lighthouse pretty much looks after itself, as you know. Sure, there's the maintenance, perhaps a bit more than elsewhere. In any case, more than at Pianois, but it's no big deal. Most important are the six months up to April. All the same, we'll do everything possible to find you a colleague. There's a retired keeper in the area who's volunteered to split the job 50-50. Well, there's always trainees. You know that we're, what we're going to do, you can do it till Christmas with supplies arriving every three weeks. Then it's the holiday and in January we'll see where we are. If you feel like it, you sign up again. If not, we'll find someone else. Naturally, you'll be on a bonus. And so on. You would have thought they were talking about sending me to the moon. Six months, no big deal. Back in the day, one of my predecessors did two years solo at Eddystone. OK, so afterwards he drank himself to death. But six months is not two years. At Pianois, when John Frott and I were stuck without supplies for 13 weeks, I'd almost say I was unhappy to finally catch sight of the swinging hoist of the supply vessel. I would happily have signed up for three or more months, and then three more after that, had it been necessary. Even two years, in spite of the wind that smashes into the windows like a gangster's fist, and the water that tumbles down the steps night after night, without which it would just be too easy. A rarefied life doesn't frighten me. Only one thing frightens me at Corduan. My Egyptian magnetism. I pray to God no one comes to the lighthouse during those six months. No one at all. Neither the engineer from lighthouses and beacons, nor the keeper on the supply vessel. I'll be perfectly happy with fish and crabs until April. Who needs fresh fruit and vegetables? Who needs a Christmas hamper? Of course, people do come to the lighthouse and rather terrible things happen when they do. I'll just leave you a tiny bit more before I go on to the next book. He's really something of a bipolar kind of man. One minute he's horribly depressed and the next he's ecstatically happy as he falls more and more in love with his lighthouse. It's written like a diary, 14th of October. I feel amazing, a new experience for me. As a result, I want to please people. Also a new experience. Shame there's no one around to share my excitement with. This lighthouse, this beautiful lighthouse, has entered me and every one of its white stones is turning me white too from the inside out. I feel I'm becoming the lighthouse. I'm lighting up. Last month, when I first set eyes on it, love at first sight. Even though it's hardly my specialist subject, it's definitely love. Well, my idea of love anyway. The idea of being the other, the feeling of belonging, giving yourself over. The other for me is the lighthouse. Corduan has woken me up. Corduan has stripped my soul naked. It has reminded me of everything that lies within. It has replaced maybe with definitely. I always had a vague feeling this day would come. I just didn't know when. It turns out to be today. Corduan has saved my knives from retirement. What a chilling image that is. So many thanks to Nicholas Royal for sending me this brilliant book and translating it from the French so brilliantly. It's utterly gripping. You can read it in a day. It will chill you to the bone and also make you think about lighthouses in a whole new way. And Nicholas Royal has thought a lot about lighthouses and I will just tell you some of the favourites that he mentioned and then move on to others that I have also loved. So The Lighthouse by Edgar Allan Poe we have already mentioned. There's also Lighthouse by Tony Parker which is a really um, wonderful book. Tony Parker is somebody who collects stories he collects live stories from people, oral histories. I don't have the actual book, um, but this is what it looks like. And Tony Parker is very much respected as a brilliant collector of oral tales. And he's collected many stories from lighthouse keepers of the 70s who told him their tales about being lighthouse keepers and what it was like and 
one of the books that I'm going to be discussing this evening is The Lamplighters by Emma Stonex, who also makes many references, particularly at the end of the book, um, in gratitude to Tony Parker, because she found much inspiration from some of the wonderful stories that he told in his book, um, Lighthouse, which is the oral histories of lighthouse keepers. And that I thoroughly recommend. He's collected stories with great honesty and managed to represent the tales of the real genuine light, lighthouse keepers and tell them in their own words and their fabulous stories, which you would hugely enjoy, full of atmosphere and true. So we also have The Lighthouse by P.D. James, which is about James's long-serving detective Adam Dalgleish making his 13th appearance. Um, he's a poet as well as a policeman, and he does make lots of poetic observations during the book. There's been a death, possibly a murder, on an island off the Cornish coast where the Prime Minister is hoping to organise a meeting of minds. So this is a lovely P.D. James typical detective novel. Then we also have The Wreck of the Aurora by Patrick McGrath, which is a short story, a vivid and powerful short story, first published in uh, an anthology called A Mountain Walked, which is a lighthouse that's been built on a hunk of basalt protruding from the Pacific Ocean, described in terms that remind one of the construction of a pyramid. The lighthouse becomes synonymous with death when one night its keeper locks his companions in their rooms and turns off the power. Years later, a woman visits the rock to try to understand why the keeper, her father, killed the light. Um, Another one which is fantastic is Pharos by Alice Thompson, which is a bit a, another kind of ghost story set on a lighthouse. There's a lot of ghost stories on lighthouse and look at that cover with that very wonderful, sinister girl in white who is the chief mystery of the book. So that's called Pharos by Alice Thompson. Uh, she's a Scottish author and she has written a ghost story about a haunted lighthouse and island which has a dreamlike atmosphere similar to another, another novel that she wrote later called Burnt Island and the story is about uh, a couple who are living in a lighthouse and one day they find this girl washed up on the shore who is strangely white and strangely blank and doesn't seem to know her name. And we gradually discover what's been going on as the book reveals its inner story. Another great uh, lighthouse book to mention is The Thing on the Shore by Tom Fletcher, which is a quite recently written story by a young writer, Tom Fletcher, in which we have a kind of H.P. Lovecraftian vibe, as if he'd moved to West Cumbria in 2011, is the way that Nicholas Royal puts it very atmospherically. And that's a story which involves modern technology, a kind of ghostly haunting, and a lighthouse. And that is a great one. Uh, another one which I have discovered in order to uh, research further into lighthouses and literature only recently is The Lighthouse by Alison Moore, which this is the story is belied by the cover because you would actually think seeing that cover that it is all about an actual lighthouse. But The Lighthouse, which is uh, the title of the book, is in fact a little silver lighthouse which is a perfume bottle, which the hero of the story carries around with him in his pocket everywhere he's go he goes. He's called Futh, and his lighthouse is a memory of his mother who left him when she was quite young. 
and it's a perfume bottle that used to have a violet scent in it. Futh is, as it turns out, a modern day perfume maker who makes artificial scents, which is a fascinating idea in itself. And he is obsessed with scents. So it's a book which mentions smells very frequently throughout the book. And the story is about Futh who has just separated from his wife and gone off on a holiday to Germany on a walking holiday with this little lighthouse in his pocket. And it is a remarkably sinister and brilliant tale, which I thoroughly recommend, even though it doesn't take place in a lighthouse. It does have many of the lighthouse themes, which we've mentioned already, such as loneliness, solitude, the phallic symbol is definitely important in this book because it's also, sorry, I don't know what's happening there with my Instagram, do apologise. Um, it's also a book where poor old Footh is um, being preyed upon by various sexually predatory women and he is a rather lost soul. It's quite a sad tale, really, poor old Booth. I did love him and felt very sorry for him in this book. And we'd slowly discover why he's carrying this little lighthouse around um, wherever he goes in his pocket. And it does take on a great significance and importance as the plot develops. And I won't tell you what happens, but it is a book which is a kind of circular story like a circular spiral staircase in a lighthouse and it does have quite a lot of unexpected drama that is revealed as the book goes on even though it's quite a slow and gentle read but it's also quite a short book so I would strongly recommend The Lighthouse by Alison Moore. Um, there's also a very sinister novel with a lighthouse theme in it, which many of you might have read when it was published, I think it was 1999, which is In the Cut by Susanna Moore, which is a deeply dark, erotic book where there's a terrifying sexual predator on the loose. And I can't really tell you too much about it with, without giving it away. But in a nutshell, a creative writing teacher witnesses a sex act involving a woman who later winds up dead. And it is a book which reveals shocking horror slowly as it goes along. But the lighthouse scene in it is brief but very important. And it's actually a tiny red lighthouse in New York, which I believe is very famous for New York dwellers. And there's a very important scene that happens in that lighthouse, which um, it's not the most fun read, but it depends what floats your literary boat. Many people absolutely love that book, In the Cut by Susanna Moore. I find it deeply disturbing, but it is still brilliant. Um, so also on the list of Nicholas Royal's top 10 favourite books, favourite lighthouse books, we obviously have to mention um, Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, which many would say is the absolute classic lighthouse book. Now, I must admit, it's a book that was um, permanently ruined for me, really, because I first read it in the very night that I had just broken up with a boyfriend who I was rather in love with. And I picked up this book, having literally broken up with him about an hour before. Not this very book, because this is a library book in very large type. Um, and I started reading it and really hated the whole experience, very much because of my own emotional state at the time, which just goes to show that bibliotherapy is all about finding the right book to read at the right time in your life. Just doing a bit of distracting lighthouse lighting there. Uh, so I have since returned to the book, to the lighthouse, and realised 
what a beautiful and wonderful book it is. And it is a book that divides readers, I think, because it's one where very little happens. It's a book that keeps you in a permanent state of anticipation as you wonder whether you're ever going to get to the lighthouse. But it is a book full of a fabulous energy and I would hugely urge you to read it if you never have. If possible, don't read it the morning after you've just had a terrible emotional break up with someone. Try and read it in a calm and positive state of mind. But I'll read you a little bit of it and you will get a sense of the beauty of the writing and the wonderful energy of it too. But it may be fine. I expect it will be fine, said Mrs Ramsay, making some little twist of the reddish brown stocking she was knitting impatiently. She's talking about the weather and whether they will actually get to the lighthouse today, which they're planning to do to go across the bay to the lighthouse. If she finished it tonight, if they did go to the lighthouse after all, it was to be given to the lighthouse keeper for his little boy, who was threatened with a tuberculous hip, together with a pile of old magazines and some tobacco. Indeed, whatever she could find lying about, not really wanted, but only littering the room, to give those poor fellows who must be bored to death sitting all day with nothing to do but polish the lamp and trim the wick and rake about on their scrap of garden, something to amuse them. For how would you like to be shut up for a whole month at a time, and possibly more in stormy weather, upon a rock the size of a tennis lawn, she would ask, and to have no letters or newspaper, and to see nobody, if you were married, not to see your wife, not to know your children were, if they were ill, if they'd fallen down and broken their legs or arms, to see the same dreary waves breaking week after week, and then a dreadful storm coming, and the windows covered with spray and birds dashed against the lamp, and the whole place rocking, and not be able to put your nose out of doors for fear of being swept out into the sea. How would you like that? she asked, addressing herself, particularly to her daughters. So she added, rather differently, one must take them whatever comforts one can. That gives you a bit of an indication of the way that it's written in a very breathless fashion. And it actually is a very energising novel. And I'm sad that I had that experience, which rather ruined it for me. But I have managed to overcome it and come back to it and fall in love with the book once more. So I wonder if any of you have read To the Lighthouse. I bet you have. And if so, did you love it or did you not? Um, the lighthouse in the novel To the Lighthouse symbolises many different things to different people. It's something intimately personal to each character. It's at once inaccessible, illuminating and infinitely interpretable. As the destination from which the novel takes its title, the lighthouse suggests that the destinations that seem surest are most unobtainable. It's very much about the love between the Ramses and their children and their different visions of um, life and positivity and their different visions, not just of the lighthouse itself, but their visions of what they want out of life and how they see life. It's very much about whether you see the good side or the bad side, whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. And it is one of those books that can be talked about endlessly and eternally and is a very beautiful read and one to keep going back to again and again. So I do thoroughly recommend that you do read To the Lighthouse if you are going to go on a lighthouse um, related journey, which I do very much recommend because I've had so much fun doing so myself. Now, one of my favourite books that I've read during this lighthouse exploratory session is The Lamplighters by Emma Stonex, which has only just come out. Isn't it a beautiful book? Look at that lovely cover. And this is a book which is actually based on a true story. It's based on the story of three real lighthouse keepers who really did disappear 
out of a lighthouse back in, I think it was the 1970s, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a story which apparently everyone knew about and discussed at the time because it was so bizarre. Three lighthouse keepers actually disappeared from their lighthouse having left a meal on the table and having the door locked so that they couldn't get out. Where had they gone? It's a genuine and brilliant mystery. And Emma Stonex has written a fictionalised version of this story. So it was inspired by the real story, but very much a fictionalised version because she tells you what happened. And if you want to discover, you must read the book. It's told in many different voices. It's told in the voices of the three lighthouse keepers who are all brilliantly written and absolutely fascinating, all very different characters. And it's also told in the voices of the three wives of those, um, or the three women folk of those lighthouse keepers. And so you have a story which evolves slowly, going back and forth in time from the event when the lighthouse keepers disappeared to the moment in uh, about 20 years later when a investigative journalist is attempting to discover what really happened. And he has decided to write his own novel all about what happened to those lighthouse keepers so it does have stories within stories but it's very much a book that comes towards its conclusion when it reveals what happened to those lighthouse keepers and it's a really gripping excellent fascinating read and one of the things that's most fabulous about it is the different voices of the lighthouse keepers themselves and the different voices of the women who are all brilliantly written and I did find all the women really annoying but in a very enjoyable way whereas I actually felt much more sympathy for the men intriguingly. So I'm just going to read you a bit from the book to give you a little um, excerpt flavour of it. I'm reading you a bit uh, which is from one of the lighthouse keepers point of view. He's called Bill and this chapter is called Crossing. 35 days on the tower. How many times have I put in this light? Eight months of the year, every year. Give or take an overdue, so that's 240 days. Multiply that by the number of years I've been in the service, and that's getting on for 15, which makes it 3,600 times that I've lit this light, or some version of it. As for the number of hours I've spent on a lighthouse in all that time, I'd rather not know. Brew the meth, swarm the vapour, turn the tap and set a match to the mantle. I could do this blindfolded, though I doubt Trident would allow it. The flames flap in their glass cage. On the maiden, the illumination itself doesn't move. Instead, the lenses around it rotate, magnifying the beam across the sea. It's eight o'clock. I'm off at midnight. In having the all-night in, I'm able to sleep the hours that a shore would make up a normal night. Between now and then, I'll watch for the burner, getting bunged or the pressure dropping. I'll log the weather, temperature, visibility, barometric pressure and wind force. Aside from that, and those aren't things I need to pay attention to anymore, I'll sit and think about how a man could shake up his life if he was unhappy with his lot. There are plenty of hours to do that. When I'm putting in my lights and extinguishing my lights, the whole world relies on me. Dawn and dusk are mine alone to do with as I please. It's a powerful feeling. So that was Bill. And then I just want to read you another voice um, so that you can get a sense of the cleverness of Emma Stonex, the author who has written these many different voices and brought the story to life, almost like a play. And by the way, in this version of the story, she's set it just off the coast of Cornwall in a fictional lighthouse. And I really enjoyed that setting where I think in the original real story, it was of Scotland. 
So now we're going to have Vince, another of the lighthouse keepers, lonely type. Two days on the tower. Tuesday morning, three weeks till Christmas. A light won't take days off or give you holidays. It wants you all the time. The others will soon start thinking what their families are doing and feeling pissed off they're stuck here while at home the fir trees are going up and the mince pie is getting eaten. That's the done thing, so I've heard. I don't think I've ever celebrated Christmas right. In the clink, we had a sloppy dinner and paper hats, but as for the so-called magic of it, I don't know what that means. This time of year, you can't extinguish your light till gone eight, but when the sun makes it through, I set to dismantling the burners, replacing them with clean ones in readiness for the night. Then I hang the curtains round the lenses. Unlikely you get to December that the sun ramps up proper enough to start a fire, but it's second nature and anyway it keeps them clean. It feels like you're getting the light dressed for the day and then at night you take off its clothes off again. I'd never tell the others that. I love those uh, poetic moments that you get from the lighthouse keepers who are telling their tales and those are um, poetic moments that come into all of these books that I'm mentioning this evening which uh, leads me back to Tony Parker with his brilliant uh, collection of stories told by the real lighthouse keepers who told their tales to him uh, giving them their oral histories and Emma Stonex was very much inspired by those stories by the real men. Um, so there's a couple of books yet to mention which I don't want to miss out. One of them is the highly successful best-selling novel L The Light Between Oceans by M. L. Stedman which is a highly romantic story great as an audio lesson, I have to say, about a couple who live in a lighthouse off the coast of Australia. Um, it's set in the time when people did still do that. Of course, nowadays, all the lighthouses have become um, unmanned because they've, uh, they're considered better to be just done mechanically. Um, so that romantic way of life is no longer an option. And so a couple live on this lighthouse in the middle of nowhere very happily. But Isabel, the, the wife, is desperate to have a child and she keeps having miscarriage, mi miscarriages until um, they get more and more depressed that they're never going to be able to have a child. But then one day a baby is washed up from the ocean, which uh, couldn't sound more like a fairy tale if it tried. But within the context of the book, we believe in what's happening. And I'll just read you the bit where the baby appears, because it is a rather wonderful and magical moment. Isabel's lips were pale and her eyes downcast. She still placed her, placed her hand fondly on her stomach sometimes, before its flatness reminded her it was empty, and still her blouses bore occasional patches from the last of the breast milk that had come in so abundantly in the first days, a feast for an absent guest. Then she would cry again as though the news were fresh. She stood with the sheets in her hands. Chores didn't stop just as the light didn't stop. Having made the bed and folded her nightgown under the pillow, she headed up to the cliff to sit by the graves a while. She tended the new one with great care, wondering whether the fledgling rosemary would take. She pulled a few weeds from around the two older crosses, now finely crystallised with years of salt, the rosemary growing doggedly despite the gales. When a baby's cry came to her on the wind, she looked instinctively to the new grave. Before logic could interfere, there was a moment when her mind told her it had all been a mistake. This last child had not been stillborn early, but was living and breathing. The illusion dissolved, but the cry did not. Then Tom's call from the gallery, On the beach! A boat! told her this was not a dream, and she moved as quickly as she could to join him on the way to the dinghy. The man in it was dead, but Tom fished a screaming bundle out of the bow. 
bloody hell, he exclaimed. Bloody hell, is he? It's a baby. Oh, my Lord above. Oh, Tom, here, give it to me. So that's when the baby arrives. And there's a dead man with the baby who we surmise is the baby's father. Tom is a very scrupulous character. Like many of the lighthouse keepers in many of these books, he's obsessed with order and perfection. He's very clean and tidy and neat. He writes everything in his log books and records everything. And he is horrified by the idea of not telling the truth about this baby. Of course, Isabel has been desperate to have a baby. She's had many miscarriages and she's only just lost a baby. So what could be more natural than to pretend that this baby is her own real baby and to deny the fact that it came from the sea along with a dead body? They therefore do not tell the truth and they make the decision to keep it a secret and pretend that it really is their child, which of course has consequences years later when they go back to shore and meet people who might know the parents of that baby that washed off, washed up on shore at the lighthouse. So it's a great story about a horrible moral dilemma which leads to disastrous decisions and um, I hope and think that you would find it a really excellent read. It's a, it is a great story and it is one of the books indeed which led me to this theme of lighthouses and literature because um, it tells the story of the lighthouse and literature in such a different way to many of the other lighthouses in literature which I have been describing so far. Oh, that one's to come. So um, one that I must also mention is the fabulous short story, The Lighthouse, by the wonderful author Agnes Owens. And this is a story first read to me by Damien Barr himself when we were at the Turnberry Hotel in Scotland, not a million miles away from Glasgow. And Damien read this story. It was the first time I'd even heard of Agnes Owens. And it's an incredibly sinister tale, which I will not give away. You can find it online, but you could also buy a collection of these short stories because they are absolutely brilliant. Also, look at that incredibly cool cover. This is a book that's the entire um, collection of her short stories, I believe. And The Lighthouse is not a long story. You could read it in a matter of 10 minutes or so. Um, and it is a really great, sinister read. I'll just read you a tiny bit of it because I don't want to give it away what happens. But you will get a sense of the terrible, menacing, lurking danger going on in this story. It's about two children who are going on a walk along a beach. And Damien chose the, the short story when we were staying at the Turnberry Hotel because it was a very similar setting um, with an amazing beach like the one in this book, which is definitely a Scottish beach. So the little girl and boy have gone in search of the lighthouse along the beach. And the girl who's ten, the boy is three, are getting really annoyed with each other. I've left my pail and spade, he said, pointing up at the sand dunes. She felt like strangling him. Well, I'm not going for them. But when he began to wail loud enough to split the rocks, she said she would go if he came with her to the lighthouse. I don't want to, he said, stamping his feet in temper. I want to go back to that other beach where mummy left us. It was then she decided she'd had enough of his tantrums. Go then, she said, giving him a shove so that he tottered on blindly for a few steps. I don't want to ever see you again. When he turned around, she was racing along the beach at a fair speed. He called on her to come back, though it was doubtful she heard him above the cries of the seagulls. But even if she had, she probably wouldn't have stopped anyway. On arriving at the lighthouse, 
She saw there was no way to get close to it, as it was surrounded by water, not unless she waited until the tide went out, and that would take hours. Sullenly, she looked up at its round turreted shape, thinking it was much more boring from this angle than it had seemed from a distance. She wished she had never come. The sea was stormy now with the waves lashing over the rocks. The whole venture had been a complete waste of time and energy, she decided. Suddenly, her attention was riveted to what looked like a body in the water. For a split second, she thought it was Bobby, which would have been quite impossible considering the distance she'd come. Nonetheless, it was a great relief to discover this was only a mooring boy. She laughed at her mistake, then began to feel uneasy. She could picture him stumbling into the sea for a paddle, thinking it was all shallow water. It was the kind of stupid thing he was liable to do. Panic swept over her. What if something terrible happened to him? She should never have left him like that. Without another thought for the lighthouse or anything but Bobby, she began running back to where she'd left him, praying that he'd be all right. From a distance, she saw him hunkered down, digging in the sand. He must have gone up the sand dunes to get his pail and spade after all, she thought. She slowed down, her legs tired and aching. Then, to her dismay, she saw the man they'd met on the golf course. He was hovering a few yards behind Bobby, poking some debris on the shore with a stick. Bobby, she called out sharply, come over to me at once. I'll leave it there. It's not long before the end of the book, of the story, I mean, so I'm not going to tell you what happens. It's a really good, very sinister and spine chilling story. And I definitely recommend it as a bedtime read this evening. I'd like to thank Aidan Hicks very much for telling me about The Watchers on the Longships by James Cobb. So, sorry, that yeah, that's The Watchers on the Longships. I don't have the actual book which I have ordered. So um, I did put it out there that I was doing this topic and asking for anyone's inspiration and advice about lighthouses and literature. And Aidan came back to me with this brilliant recommendation, which sounds like such a good read. I'm dying to get hold of it. Aidan calls it a thoroughly preposterous and fun tale of the collision of Methodism with smuggling and murderous wreckers and a young girl who valiantly manages to keep the new lighthouse lit all on her own in the midst of storm and skullduggery. What is not to immediately want to dive into with that fantastic resume of a story? I'm dying to read it, but I haven't been able to get hold of it yet, unfortunately. Um, Aidan also calls it moralize, a moralising Methodist novel uh, and if possible, wash it down with brandy. So thanks for that excellent recommendation, Aidan. I'm dying to read it and hopefully we'll do so in the near future and I'll report back. Another lighthouse in literature, which must be mentioned, is the fabulous Tove Janssen's Moomin Papa at Sea, in which the Moomin family who many of you will be familiar with as some of my favourite characters in literature, go in search of a new life. Moomin Papa decides in a somewhat um, middle-aged crisis vein to move from their idyllic house in Moomin Valley and to take to the seas and go in search of a lighthouse, which I think he saw in his youth. And so he uproots the whole family and takes them off on an adventure into the ocean and they find a wonderful island with a lighthouse and they go and live there and at first it all seems idyllic and wonderful but slowly things begin to go wrong and one of the things that goes wrong which I very much loved as a story because it's so resonant for many women particularly after having children um, very much resonating with the story The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Uh, Moomin Mama starts painting murals inside the lighthouse and she gets so obsessed with her murals and so lost in the world of art that she slowly 
disappears from her family and literally disappears into the mural and one day the family come in and they can't find her because she's gone into the mural and Moomin Mama generally is the perfect mother who always has a sandwich in her handbag for anyone that needs it she always has the right ointment plasters maybe black currant um, juice for anyone that's thirsty she is the perfect mother until they move to this lighthouse and then she slowly gets sucked into her own mural which is deeply sinister so that's another lighthouse in literature where madness is lurking very much like in the fabulous Pharicide, which I was talking about earlier the French novel written by Vincent de Svartz and translated by Nicholas Royal, in which the lighthouse brings on a kind of madness to the lighthouse keeper. I'm just going to read you a little bit from Moomin Papa at Sea. I love this picture of the steps inside the lighthouse. And there you see Moomin Troll at the top of the steps, looking in great terror down those stairs. When he was by the door, he remembered the stairs and hesitated. The winding stairs at night were an awful thought. In the day, you could run up them, not giving yourself time to think. Moomin Troll went back into the room and took the hurricane lamp off the table. He found the matches on the mantelpiece. The door closed behind him and the tower opened up below him like a deep, dark well. He couldn't see it, but he knew it was there. The flame of the hurricane lamp flickered rose and fell and then burned steadily. He put it down and plucked up courage to take a look. The light had frightened all the shadows and they fluttered giddily all around him when he lifted the lamp up. So many of them, fantastic shapes flickering up and down the hollow inside of the lighthouse. It was beautiful. The staircase wound downwards, down, 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 grey and fragile, like the skeleton of some prehistoric animal and was lost in the darkness at the bottom. With every step he took, the shadows danced on the walls all around him. It was much too beautiful to think of being frightened. So Moomin Troll went down the stairs step by step, holding the lamp tightly, and reached the muddy floor at the bottom of the lighthouse. The door creaked as usual and it felt very heavy. He stood outside on the rock in the cold, unreal moonlight. Isn't life exciting, Moomin Troll thought. Everything can change all of a sudden, and for no reason at all. The staircase is suddenly quite beautiful, and the glade something I don't want to think about any more. So that's Moomin Troll going through a moment of total volt fast from utter terror to loving the beauty of the lighthouse that he finds himself in, which is highly reminiscent of... Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, in which the lighthouse is perceived in very different lights by each member of the family. Um, so Tove Janssen and Virginia Woolf obviously do have more in common than meets the eye. One thing I'd like to mention before we come to the end is also that Robert Louis Stevenson, well known, of course, for writing such masterpieces as kidnapped and Treasure Island uh, came from a family of lighthouse keepers and there is a superb book all about um, the Stevenson lighthouse keepers which is called I think I'm just trying to find it now the Stevenson lighthouse the Stevenson lighthouse keepers it's going to come to me in a minute Anyway, it's a brilliant book, which I would very much recommend, which goes through the history of the Robert Louis Stevenson family, three generations of lighthouse keepers. Uh, their involvement in lighthouse engineering began in 1772 with Robert Stevenson, who was Robert Louis Stevenson's grandfather. And the account of these uh, ancestors of Stevenson is written by Bella Bathurst. It's a biography 
with three generations of those lighthouse keepers and it's all about how they jointly created some of the most famous and long-lasting lighthouses all around the coast of Scotland which is something that not everyone thinks about in conjunction with Robert Louis Stevenson. So there's a fascinating fact for you to end this wonderful session all about lighthouses in literature. So here's my little lighthouse to see you on your way for the evening. It's been great to have you here with me tonight and I hope that you have enjoyed this session all about, all about lighthouses and literature. Don't forget to share with me any thoughts you have about lighthouses and literature or any questions you might have of a bibliotherapy nature. I'm always willing to give you some bibliotherapy recommendations and I have hugely enjoyed exploring all those lighthouse related stories this evening. Um, and I definitely have particularly loved this beautiful book, which is really fab. And on the more sinister note, I have really enjoyed Pharaside, which is a great one to read really just in a couple of hours. So try and get hold of that and read it in an evening. So much better than watching TV. You can actually try reading it aloud as well because it's a really great one to read aloud with a friend, partner, neighbour or dog. So thanks so much for joining me this evening. Next week I'll be on my own Instagram and Facebook live at Ella Bear 2 and I'm going to talk about hermits in literature because I think that's a rather rich and wonderful vein of literary characters to be explored. So if you have any hermits in literature that you can tell me about, or if you have any bibliotherapy questions that you'd like to ask me about, do come and join me next week. And meanwhile, curl up with some lovely lighthouse books and enjoy some lighthouse reading. Thanks for joining me tonight and see you soon. Good night.